Okay, in today's lecture, uh, we're going to cover the section 2.3 material on characterizations of invertible matrices. And uh, the majority of this section deals with uh, a result known as the invertible matrix theorem, uh, which gives several equivalent conditions uh, which we can use to determine whether a square matrix is invertible. Uh, or if we know that a square matrix is invertible, uh, we have several um, consequences of that matrix being invertible or non-singular. Um, so let's start by presenting this theorem. So the following theorem is referred to as the invertible matrix theorem. Uh, we'll revisit this uh, a little bit later in the course once we have some more equivalent conditions. Uh, but here's what it says. If we have a matrix A, which is a square matrix, uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind for this theorem is it's only valid for square matrices then uh, the following conditions are all equivalent. So any two of them uh, are equivalent to each other. And keep in mind uh, that implies that if any one of these conditions does not hold, that means that uh, none of the other conditions can hold uh, either. So uh, the first condition is that the matrix A is invertible. So if we have a square matrix A, which is invertible, uh, then that means that A must be row equivalent to the n by n identity matrix. Uh, so we saw that result in our previous section, uh, 2.2. Uh, now, that also implies that the row echelon form of the matrix A has no zero rows. Um, or equivalently, that the matrix A has n pivot positions. Uh, so equivalently, um, if uh, we have no zero rows, that implies the equation A times X is equal to zero. That is the homogeneous linear system uh, with coefficient matrix given by A has only the trivial solution where X is equal to the zero vector. Uh, and that means, uh, that is equivalent to the columns of the matrix A forming a linearly independent set. We saw uh, those can, two conditions, D and E, uh, being equivalent uh, in our section 1.7 material on linear independence. Uh, the columns of a matrix A are linearly independent if and only if uh, the uh, matrix equation AX equals to zero has only the trivial solution. Um, if we think about uh, how an mat uh, invertible matrix relates to a, a linear transformation, uh, well, the linear transformation defined by x uh, being mapped to a times x is uh, a one-to-one -one, uh, transformation. Uh, we saw in our earlier section that if the um, uh, equation AX equals to zero has only the trivial solution, that is if the only vector that maps to zero is the zero vector, then that transformation is one to one. Uh, equivalently, that means that the matrix equation AX equals to B has a unique solution for any B uh, in all of RN. Uh, and this is equivalent to uh, the columns of the matrix A spanning all of Rn. Uh, now, another way to phrase that, um, if we think about this as a linear transformation, is that the linear transformation, which uh, maps x to A times x, uh, would map Rn onto all of Rn. So if we span Rn, that means that we can map to any vector uh, in Rn, Therefore, that transformation would be an onto mapping. Uh, equivalently, there, that means that there is a um, n by n matrix C such that C times A is equal to I. So there's some matrix which I could multiply um, A by on the left-hand side uh, in order to get back to the identity. Um, and that is equivalent to there existing some n by n matrix D uh, such that A times D, so multiplying A on the right-hand side by some matrix, gets us back to the identity matrix. And uh, lastly, uh, A transpose would also be 
an invertible matrix. So if A is invertible, then its transpose is also invertible. Um, so these conditions which we've established uh, are all equivalent. If we can show any one of these conditions immediately, all of the other conditions hold. Or if we can show any one of these conditions is not satisfied, uh, that means that none of these other conditions could uh, be satisfied. Um, so this invertible matrix theorem has some useful consequences uh, when we're analyzing uh, different mappings or solution sets um, for uh, systems of linear equations. Uh, so let's look at a few examples which are going to make use of this theorem. Uh, so in our first example, we're asked to determine if the matrix A, uh, where all three rows of that matrix are uh, given by 2, 3, 4, is invertible, and justify our answer. Um, so in order to show that uh, this matrix is invertible, well, A being invertible is condition A, in the invertible matrix theorem. So I can show that any one of these other conditions holds in, other to sh in order to show that um, A is invertible. So uh, an easy way which we could uh, try to show that A is not invertible is by showing that the row echelon form of this matrix A has a row of zeros. And it can be seen pretty easily here, uh, since all three rows are identical. I could row reduce A by taking row 2 minus row 1, or row 3 minus row 1. And I would have the matrix 2, 3, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So this is the <coughs> uh, row echelon form of the matrix A, and we can see that it does contain a row of zeros. So let's start by saying uh, the row echelon form of this matrix A uh, contains a row of zeros. Um, so by the invertible matrix theorem, uh, which for the rest of this section I'll uh, use a shorthand IMT to refer to this theorem, uh, specifically part C of this theorem. A uh, cannot be invertible uh, because if A were invertible, we know that the row echelon form of A could not contain a row of zeros, but since it does contain a row of zeros, uh, A cannot be invertible. So here, uh, this matrix A is singular. It does not have an inverse. All right, so let's look at some other examples. Uh, in this next example, we are asked to determine uh, which of the following matrices are invertible, and uh, we're trying to use as few calculations as possible, and we want to justify each of our answers here. So uh, in part A, uh, we have the following matrix, uh, and we want to know whether it is invertible. Uh, let's maybe call this matrix A. Uh, now, for a 2 by 2 matrix, uh, we have a condition for uh, whether it's invertible, namely by looking at the determinant of A. So if we look at the determinant of A, uh, we see here that we would have 4 times 9, or 36, minus the product of the off diagonal. 6 times 6 is 36. So we have a 0 determinant. So uh, A is singular. It is not invertible. Um, now, an equivalent way, uh, well, there's, there's a lot of different ways which we could have go, uh, gone about showing that A is not, uh, is not invertible. Um, an alternative approach here that's also pretty straightforward is to think about the columns of this matrix A. Uh, 
uh, let's maybe call these columns two vectors, say a1 and a2. Um, and we can note that a1 and a2 are scalar multiples of one another. Uh, in fact, a2 is equal to a negative three halves of a1. So if two uh, vectors in the plane are scalar multiples of each other, uh, that means that they are linearly dependent. Um, so we could say the vectors a1 and a2 are linearly dependent. So uh, by the invertible matrix theorem, uh, specifically, uh, let's see which part here, part E, uh, A is not invertible. Or equivalently, we could say A is singular. Uh, because part E of the invertible matrix theorem uh, said that the columns of A would have to form a linearly independent set if A was invertible, but since uh, A1 and A2 are linearly dependent, uh, we see that A cannot be invertible. Uh, now there are several other approaches that we could use here. Um, here's a, a couple of easy approaches for part A. Um, now in part B, uh, we have the following three by three matrix. We want to know if it's invertible. And um, pretty quickly here, we can see if we're examining the columns of this matrix, Let's call this matrix A uh, and its columns, A1, A2, and A3. Well, we recognize that the second column, A2, is the zero vector. And recall from section 1.7, any set of vectors which contains the zero vector must be linearly dependent. Um, so here, a little justification, we can say that A2 is equal to the zero vector. Uh, so the columns of the matrix A are linearly dependent. I believe that was either theorem one, uh, theorem eight or theorem nine from uh, that section uh, 1.7 material. Um, so here the columns of A are uh, linearly dependent. So by the invertible matrix theorem, uh, specifically part E, A is uh, not invertible. If it were invertible, the columns of A would have to form a linearly independent set, but we've shown that they are dependent. All right. Uh, so let's consider another one. Uh, in part C, we have another three by three matrix. Uh, by looking at the columns of this matrix, it's not clear uh, that one is a scalar multiple of the others. So we can't say uh, whether these are linearly uh, dependent very easily. Um, now, another approach that we can, or, or one approach we can always use to determine if uh, a given matrix is invertible is to see if it's row equivalent to the identity matrix. Um, so that uh, was condition B in our invertible matrix theorem. Uh, so let's try row reducing this thing. We have for the matrix A, a, a lead uh, entry of one in our first row, and we need to eliminate the negative three in that third row. So to do that, uh, we could take row three uh, plus three times row one. So my first two rows are gonna be one, negative five, negative four, and zero, three, four. And when I perform this operation on uh, my third row, I have three minus three is zero. Uh, minus 15 plus six would be negative nine and then negative 12 plus zero is negative 12. So now uh, the leading entry in my second row is a three, and I know I need to eliminate the negative nine that appears below it. So one way that I could do that would be to take uh, row three and add 
3 times rho 2. So we have 1, negative 5, negative 4, 0, 3, 4. And my last row is then 0, 9 minus 9 is 0, and 12 minus 12 is 0. So we've then established uh, that uh, the um, uh, row echelon form, this is not reduced row echelon, but it is row echelon form of uh, this matrix A, uh, has a row of all zeros. That is, it does not have three pivot positions. Um, so um, here, let's maybe make a note. We have a row of zeros. So by the inner uh, uh, invertible matrix theorem, uh, specifically part uh, C, the matrix A is not invertible. Uh, since we had a row of all zeros after uh, we put it in row echelon form. Okay. Um, so let's look at the following example. Here we'll have um, several statements involving matrices, and uh, we are asked to determine whether each of these statements is either true or false, and we need to justify each of our answers. Um, so let's look at part A here. Uh, part A says if there is an n by n matrix D, uh, such that A times D is equal to I, uh, then there is also an n by n matrix C uh, such that C times uh, A is equal to I. Um, so pretty quickly we can recognize this statement as being uh, true. Uh, if we apply the invertible matrix theorem, uh, these two statements are uh, exactly uh, conditions J and K in the invertible matrix theorem. So we know that J holds if and only if K holds. So if J holds, then K must also hold. So this result is true by the intermediate, uh, by the uh, invertible matrix theorem. Uh, so let's look at another one in part B. Um, we have the statement, if the columns of A are linearly independent, then the columns of A must span all of Rn. So again, we can recognize pretty quickly this statement as being true because these two conditions are two equivalent conditions from the invertible matrix theorem. So here this statement is true by the invertible matrix theorem, uh, the columns of A being linearly independent is uh, condition E from the invertible matrix theorem, which holds if and only if uh, the columns of A span R. That was condition H in the invertible matrix theorem. So our first two statements we found to be true. Um, so moving to part C, uh, we have the statement, if the matrix equation AX equals to B has at least one solution uh, for each vector B in uh, Rn, then the solution is unique for each uh, B. All right, so let's think about whether this statement is true. We're uh, given the equation AX equals to B has at least one solution uh, for each value of B. And then uh, we would want to see, well, does that mean uh, that the solution is unique uh, for each B? Um, so here, uh, if uh, th this statement holds uh, if and only if, uh, a is a square matrix. So uh, one thing to be a little careful of, again, with the um, invertible matrix theorem is it only holds for square matrices. Uh, 
Uh, so if the matrix A were square, then the equation AX equals to B having at least one solution for each B in R in would mean that uh, the linear transformation <clears throat> from X to A times X would map onto all of R in. If for every B in R in, uh, we were able to uh, map to that vector by taking A times X as our transformation, then that would be uh, this condition I, <clears throat> which would be equivalent to uh, condition G, where the equation A times X equals to B has a unique solution for any B in R in. So if this statement specified <clears throat> that A was a square matrix, uh, then this statement would be true. However, it does not specify that A is square. Um, so here we could say false. Uh, it is not uh, known if A is square. Um, so uh, as an example, we could maybe consider uh, a matrix A of the form, <clears throat> say, uh, 1, 2, 1, 2, uh, in which case uh, we would have uh, a um, free, var free variable uh, for uh, this linear system being described by the equation AX equals to B. So for any B, we would have at least one solution of such an equation. Um, however, uh, this solution would not be uh, unique for each B. So here, uh, if our matrix is, um, or well, if this were square, this wouldn't hold. Uh, let's say that we had um, something of the form uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. Uh, so if our matrix A was not square, we would have a free variable and uh, we would have a at least one uh, solution um, for any equation of the form A times X is equal to B. Uh, where B is some vector in uh, R3, um, but the solution would not be unique due to the fact that we have a free variable. Um, okay, so part C, a little tricky there. It, it seems like at first maybe that statement should be true, uh, but recall that uh, these conditions are only equivalent if A is a square matrix. Uh, so in part D, let's look at the next statement. Uh, if the linear transformation uh, x being mapped to a times x maps r in onto r in, then a has n pivot positions. Um, so this statement uh, we can recognize as being true uh, by applying the invertible matrix theorem. Let's think about which two conditions are being stated here. Uh, so the linear transformation x uh, mapping to ax being onto is condition i from the invertible matrix theorem, which holds if and only if uh, condition c holds. Now condition c in the invertible matrix theorem states uh, exactly that a has n pivot positions. All right. Um, so now let's consider... Uh, uh, the argument, so so one thing that you might uh, argue here is, well, uh, did we know from this statement that A was square? Um, so uh, how do we know that A is a square matrix in this case? Well, uh, X is, uh, or this transformation is mapping R in onto R in, uh, so the input uh, is an n-dimensional vector, and the output is n-dimensional. Um, so in order for a times x to be defined, if x was an n-dimensional vector, uh, a would have to have n columns, and for the output to be a vector in Rn, uh, a would have to have n rows. So since we're mapping from 
Rn2 itself, uh, we know that this matrix, which defines the transformation, would be a square matrix. Uh, now, in our last condition, or our last statement, uh, part E, uh, it says, if there is a vector B in Rn such that the equation Ax equals to B is inconsistent, then the transformation uh, X um, being mapped to A times X is not one-to-one. -one. So we want to see whether that statement is true. Uh, so here we can recognize uh, these conditions as being two of the conditions from uh, the invertible matrix theorem. So if one of them does not hold, then the other one does not hold. So what are these two conditions? Uh, well, condition G is this equa uh, the condition stating that this equation, Ax equals to B, would have a solution, a unique solution, for any B in R. So if there is uh, some B in R in such that this equation does not have a solution, that is, it's inconsistent, then all other conditions uh, must not hold as well. Um, so here, this statement would be true by the invertible matrix theorem. Uh, in particular, we can say if a condition G does not hold, then uh, condition F, which states that the uh, mapping X mapping to uh, A times X would be one to one, uh, also does not hold. All right. Um, so uh, depending on uh, what statements that we're given about a matrix or some mapping, we can make conclusions uh, about that mapping or the matrix, uh, which would be the standard matrix for that mapping. All right. Um, so some other questions which we'll pose here um, are more or less true-false statements, um, but require maybe a little bit more interpretation. Uh, so in our next example, uh, we ask whether a square matrix with two identical columns can be invertible and uh, justify our answer, why or why not. Um, so here, let's think about this. Uh, we are told that we're working with a square matrix, and our square matrix has two columns which are identical. Um, so if two columns in a, um, a matrix are identical, if we consider the set of column vectors for that matrix, that means that that set of vectors would be linearly dependent. Uh, we could form a uh, non-trivial linear combination of those vectors to get the zero vector. And if the uh, columns of a matrix A are not linearly independent, then the matrix A cannot be invertible by uh, the um, invertible matrix theorem. Um, so let's write out our answer with a little justification here. Um, so in short, our answer is no, this is not possible. And what is our justification? Well, let's suppose uh, that the columns of uh, this matrix are the vectors v1, v2, up through vn. So say if it's an n by n matrix. Um, and uh, we're told that two of the columns are identical. So by uh, re-indexing these values, by rearranging the order of these uh, column vectors, uh, we can assume Uh, that V1 and V2 are the same. So let's suppose the first two columns of this matrix are uh, equal to each other. Uh, then that means uh, we could take the linear combination 1V1 minus 1V2 uh, plus 0 V3 and 0 for the weights of all of our other vectors up through Vn.
And since v1 is equal to v2, their difference would give me the zero vector. So I've then found a non-zero linear combination of the vectors v1 through vn, uh, which gives me the zero vector, which means that v1, v2, up through vn are linearly uh, dependent. Um, so by the invertible matrix theorem, uh, specifically part E, uh, A, uh, well, I say A, uh, the matrix that has this as its columns, we didn't give it a name, uh, the matrix is not invertible. Since the uh, columns of that matrix did not form a linearly independent set. All right. Uh, so the next question uh, we could ask in our next example is if A is an invertible matrix, uh, then the columns of A uh, inverse form a linearly independent set. And we're told to explain why. So if A is invertible, we're guaranteed the columns of the inverse matrix are linearly independent. Um, so let's think about why that's true. So we know that if A is invertible, that means uh, that there exists uh, some inverse matrix. Um, so there exists uh, a matrix which we would denote as A inverse, um, uh, such that A times A inverse or A inverse times A would be equal to the identity matrix. Um, so that means that A inverse is itself invertible with an inverse of A. So recall from uh, our previous section that if A is invertible, then so is its inverse, and the inverse of the inverse matrix is A itself. So we've established so far that A inverse is an invertible matrix, but by the invertible matrix theorem, if A inverse is invertible, that means that its, that its columns uh, must be linearly independent. Um, so here, by the invertible matrix theorem, uh, specifically, let's see which part, part E, uh, the columns of A inverse are linearly independent. Okay. So the next thing we'll talk about uh, in uh, towards the end of this section, of course, we could uh, look at many more examples uh, re regarding whether uh, some statement is true or false or whether two conditions uh, apply uh, imply one another uh, through the inner uh, through the invertible matrix theorem um, but so we don't need to do many more of those uh, but in this last part of the section we'll see uh, how to characterize uh, the inverse of a linear transformation or what it means uh, for a linear transformation to be invertible um, so let's consider the following. Uh, suppose that we have a linear transformation, uh, let's call it T, from Rn to Rn, uh, with a standard matrix of A. So here, A is some n by n matrix, uh, such that T of x is defined as matrix multiplication, A times x. Uh, 
Uh, now, if the matrix A, which is our standard matrix, is invertible, that means that A inverse times A of X, well, A inverse times A would be the identity. So taking the identity times X would just give us back X. And that implies that an inverse transformation of this mapping T exists. Um, so let's try to visualize this here. Uh, we have some transformation from R in T, uh, as, which is defined as a linear transformation, so it can be expressed as a matrix transform, uh, is mapping to R in. So a vector x in R in is being mapped to a vector a times x in R in uh, by this mapping t. Um, and uh, the, the mapping that we're applying or the transformation is uh, applying multiplication by the matrix A. So if A is invertible, uh, that means that we could then take A inverse and apply it to this element A times X. So if we multiply A inverse uh, times A of X, uh, we get back to the uh, vector x. So there is some transformation moving in the opposite direction. Uh, I'm going to call it s of x, uh, which is found by taking a inverse and applying it to a times x, which takes us back to the element x itself. Um, so here uh, we can define uh, what it means for uh, a transformation to be invertible or what we mean by the inverse of such a transformation uh, more formally. Uh, so let's use the following definition here. We would say that a linear transformation T from Rn to Rn is uh, invertible if there exists some function S from Rn to Rn such that the composition of s with t of x is equal to x, uh, or the composition of t with s of x is equal to uh, x. Um, so here, uh, the my notation above wasn't um, quite right. Instead of uh, s of x, I should have been saying s acting on a times x. Um, so here uh, we can think about this composition in the following way. So uh, our first composition is taking s of t of x. So we would first apply t of x to get a element a times x. And then if we apply the transformation s to that, so taking s which acts on AX, uh, we map back to the original element that we had X. Uh, or if we were to reverse uh, the order of that composition, let's say uh, that we took um, S of X and then apply uh, T to it, we would get back to the same transformation. So if I were to start with some vector, let's call it x in R in, and I apply s to that, that is taking s of x, which is a inverse times x, I would get some element a inverse times x. And then if I follow that up by applying the transformation t, well, A of A inverse of X takes me back to this original element X. So if there is such uh, a transformation which accomplishes this for all values of X in R in, uh, then S is referred to as the inverse of T, uh, 
and is denoted as T inverse. Um, now, for an invertible uh, matrix transformation, it turns out that this inverse uh, is unique uh, and can be defined in terms of an inverse matrix. We've already been hinting at that uh, with the figure that we've given above. Um, but let's look at the following result. This is a result on existence and uniqueness of an inverse linear transformation. Uh, so here's what it says. If we have a linear transformation T from Rn to Rn, uh, and A is the standard matrix for T, then uh, this transformation T is invertible if and only if the matrix A is an invertible matrix, in which case the linear transformation S, uh, defining uh, or defined by S of X is A inverse uh, times X, is the unique function such that uh, the composition of S with T or T with S is equal to X uh, for all X in Rn. So this inverse uh, transformation of an invertible transformation is unique. That's defined by that unique matrix A inverse times X. Uh, so let's look at an example working with uh, an invertible linear transformation. Um, so here we are considering a linear transformation T from the plane to itself uh, defined by T of x1, x2. So we're taking vectors or points in the plane and we're mapping them to points in the plane where the first coordinate is given by 6x1 minus 8x2 and the second coordinate is minus 5x1 plus 7x2. Uh, so for this transformation, we want to show that T is invertible and find a formula for T inverse. Um, so let's start by trying to show that T is invertible. Um, so using the previous theorem that we just discussed, uh, we could uh, guarantee that T is invertible uh, if we were able to show that the matrix, uh, which is the standard matrix for T, is an invertible matrix. Um, so let's start by trying to find that standard matrix. Uh, and recall from our earlier sections, to find the standard matrix for a transformation, we need to look at the image of the columns of the identity matrix under this transformation. So here, T of E1, that is T of uh, 1, 0, the first column of the identity matrix, uh, is mapped to 6, negative 5. And uh, T of E2, that is T of 0, 1, is mapped by our transformation uh, to negative 8, 7. Um, so here, the standard matrix uh, for this transformation T is the matrix A, whose first column is the image of uh, E1 under this transformation. That is 6, negative 5. And our second column is the image of E2 under this transformation, negative 8, 7. So the question becomes whether this matrix A is invertible. And to determine whether A is invertible, we can look at its determinant. So the determinant of A, uh, it would be the product of the diagonals, 6 times 7, uh, which is 42 minus the product of the off diagonals, negative 8 and negative 5, would be 40. So we're left with a determinant of 2, uh, which is certainly non-zero. Um, so that implies that A is invertible. And the inverse of A is given by 1 over the determinant, so 1 half times the 2 by 2 matrix we get by interchanging the diagonal entries of A, 
So six and seven become seven and six, and our off diagonals uh, we change the sign of. So our negative eight and negative five become positive eight and positive five. So multiplying our one half by this two by two matrix, uh, we have seven halves, four, five halves, and three. So the formula for uh, T inverse, um, or well, uh, so, so since A is invertible and A was the standard matrix, uh, we have shown that the uh, transformation T is invertible. Uh, and to find a formula um, for T inverse acting on uh, some vector in the plane, say its components are x1, x2, uh, well, it's found by taking A inverse times uh, a vector x. So here we had 7 halves 4, 5 halves 3. We're multiplying by some vector whose components are x1 and x2. Uh, so we get, for our output, uh, 7 halves x1 plus 4 x2 and 5 halves x1 plus 3 times x2. Uh, for our formula uh, acting on, uh, or a formula for uh, T inverse. All right. Um, so we have the following formula for how to calculate the inverse of that transformation. Um, so let's look in our last example uh, at the following. So in this last one, we are told here to suppose that we have a linear transformation t from rn to rn, uh, and this transformation has the property that t of u is equal to t of v uh, for some pair of distinct vectors u and v in rn. So we have two different vectors u and v that have the same image under the transformation t. And the question is, can that transformation T uh, map Rn onto all of Rn? And why or why not? So let's think about this uh, here. Since we have two distinct values, U and V, or, or two distinct vectors, U and V, uh, that have the same image, that implies that T is not uh, one to one. That is the definition of a one-to-one -one mapping is that no two uh, vectors have, or no two distinct vectors have the same image. So here T is not one-to-one. -one. So if T is not a one-to-one -one mapping, then uh, by the uh, invertible matrix theorem, uh, specifically part F, um, uh, the uh, standard matrix uh, A for this transformation um, is not invertible. Or we could say it is a singular matrix. Uh, so if this uh, matrix A is not invertible, well that is equivalent by the uh, invertible matrix theorem uh, to condition I um, which said uh, that the transformation x mapping to ax uh, would be an onto mapping. Um, so here, t is not an onto mapping. Um, so our answer to this question is no. If we have 
uh, a linear transformation from Rn to itself, so that its standard matrix is a square, n by n matrix. Uh, and we have two distinct vectors, u and v, which have the same image. Well, that implies that T is not a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, therefore, by the intermediate, uh, by the uh, invertible matrix theorem, uh, that mapping T can also not be an onto mapping. All right. Uh, so in this uh, section 2.3, uh, we had uh, most of our results coming directly from the invertible matrix theorem. Uh, and we've introduced the idea of an invertible linear mapping and uh, seen how to find a formula uh, for the inverse of uh, such an invertible mapping.